What about distant starlight? I want to spend some time on this one because it, this, this seems to be a big problem for a lot of people in terms of embracing what the Bible teaches. It really shouldn't be, but um, because of the weakness of our faith sometimes, we need, we need a little more. Distant starlight really is not a problem for young universe. What I'm talking about here is these, the, the fact that we can see these galaxies that are billions of light years away. And when I use the term light year, that is a unit of distance, not time. A light year is about six trillion miles, okay? And so when I say the universe is billions of light years in size, that just means it's really big. It doesn't mean it's old. People hear the word year in there and they think that, well, doesn't it have something to do with time? Well, a light year is the distance that light under normal circumstances would travel in one year. And so you'd think if these galaxies are billions of light years away, that it would take light, you know, billions of years to get from there to here. And obviously the light has got from there to here because we see them. And so doesn't that prove the universe is billions of years old? And this has come to be called the distant starlight problem. But I, and I want to give you what I think is a solution to this. There's actually a number of different ways to resolve it, which is interesting. And of course, God has access to solutions that, that we might not have even thought of or even considered. He's not bound by laws of nature as we are. But I do want to point out that some of the proposed solutions really don't work. And I, and I mention this because sometimes people will come up and say, well, have you thought of this? And yeah, we've thought of that, and there's a reason it doesn't work. Some of the simpler solutions that um, people think of really have been investigated, and they don't pan out. The idea that the distances aren't real, maybe the galaxies are all within 6,000 light years, it's not realistic. Even our own galaxy isn't within that distance. The, the, these distances, I, I won't go into all the details, but good, there's good science to support the fact that these are incredible distances. The idea the speed of light was much faster in the past, I think that was very worthy of consideration. I'm glad that they looked into that, but I think there's compelling evidence that it was not faster in the past. The speed of light is linked into other properties in nature. It sets the relationship between, for example, between electric fields and magnetic fields. It sets the relationship between energy and mass. And so if you, if you tinker with the speed of light very much in vacuum, um, it might not even make atoms possible. So uh, we like the speed of light the way it is. Uh, light was created in transit is one that I want to spend a little more time uh, showing you why I don't believe that's a good idea for starlight. People have pointed out, well, the universe was made mature in the sense it was functional. Adam was made as adult. Uh, he didn't have to grow up from a baby. And if you assume he grew up from a baby, you'd conclude the wrong age by looking at him. And that's true. That's certainly true. And so people have said, couldn't starlight be that way? Couldn't it be that God made the beams of light, the star, you know, connecting the star to the earth? Uh, I think not. And, and the reason is because it would require God to create fictional images and movies, and I want to show you what I mean by this. Here we have Supernova 1987A. There was a star in one of the Magellanic Clouds, and that little star right there in 1987 decided to blow itself to bits. Very sad, but um, it's a supernova, and so that star blew up. Now this star is in one of the uh, Magellanic Clouds. It's over 100,000 light years away, 100 and, let's say 170,000 light years away, something like that. And today, it looks like that. We see expanding star guts, what's left of the star expanding off into space. Now, if you say, well, when did that happen? Now, the secularists would say, well, 170,000 years ago, and the light just got here in 1987. And if you say, well, no, it, the reason we're able to see that is because God made the beam of light already on its way. When did this happen? Well, if you, if you believe in light and transit, this didn't happen. It was just a picture that God made in a beam of light about 6,000 light years out that finally reached the earth in 1987. If you believe in light in transit, this star never existed, that explosion never happened, and by the way, this doesn't exist either. These are just pictures that God put in a beam of light. And that really bothers me. It's not that I don't think that God has the power to do that. Of course he has the power to do that. The question is, is it consistent with his nature to do something like that? And I don't think it is. And if, you know, I don't think God would create you know, light with fictional information in it, as it were. And if you say, well, I don't know, I think he might. Be careful, because how do you know I'm here right now, right? I mean, how do you know God isn't making the light one inch away from your eye, an image of me? Well, we hear you too, no problem. God made the sound an inch away from your ear. Um, no, I don't think that, that God makes fictional pictures for us. So if light in transit is true, then none of these things have ever actually existed. But we do see these things. And I think there's a better answer anyway. Uh, one, one of the ones that I thought was a little more plausible, I think it's not the right answer, but I want to mention it because at least it, it deserves consideration. Uh, Dr. Russ Humphreys has pointed out that um, time can flow at different rates under different circumstances. Einstein discovered that. 
And Humphreys says, well, maybe that's the solution to starlight. Maybe the, that clocks on Earth tick slower than clocks in the universe. And uh, I've, I've chatted with him about this. He's, it's an interesting model. I, I haven't seen the math work out in a way that actually solves distant starlight, though. But he continues to work on it, and it's interesting. I'm going to suggest that the solution may involve, I'm going to give you what I think the answer is. I think it involves the one-way speed of light. And that is the speed of light on a one-way trip, as opposed to bouncing out off a mirror, a two-way trip. The speed of light in vacuum is 186,282 miles per second, very fast. But that is a round trip average speed. And what I mean by that is if we wanted to measure the speed of light, here's how we could do it in principle. We could build a very long hallway, okay, 186,000 miles long. We'll pretend we have government funding so we can waste it that way, okay? <laughs> And we'll, we'll put it out there. And so I'm going to stand over here on, on this end with my flashlight. I'll have a mirror at the other end and, or another flashlight. Either would work. And, and what I'm going to do is when, when the clock strikes noon, I'm going to send out that, I'm going to turn on the flashlight for just an instant, send that pulse out, and it'll reflect back. And as soon as I see the reflection, I'm going to look at the clock and see how much time has elapsed. And if we were to, we, if we were to do this, we would find it takes two seconds for light to go out and come back. And so it's traveled a distance of 186,282 miles twice, and it's taken two seconds to do that. So the average speed is 186,282 miles per second. That's how you get the speed of light, and that's, that's what we would find. Most people assume that it took one second to go out and one second to come back. But we don't actually know that, do we? All we know is the total time is two seconds. It could be, hypothetically, the case that the light zips out and takes all of two seconds. Maybe, maybe it takes no time at all for it to get out there, and then it takes all of two seconds to get back. That's a possibility. Or maybe it's the reverse. Maybe it takes all of two seconds to travel out there, and then it zips back instantaneously. And uh, people have said, well, why? Is the mirror affecting it? No, it doesn't have to be the mirror. You could even use another flashlight out there. And when, we, when your buddy sees the beam, he turns on the return tray. It could just be that the nature of space is such that light propagates at a different speed this way than it does that way. You'd say, why would it be that way? Well, there are certain crystals that do that, where the speed of light is very different in one direction than another. And it could be that the vacuum of space is like that. The point is, we don't know. And you see where I'm going with this, because if, if this is the case, if light, when it's moving away from me, is slower, and when it moves toward me, it's much quicker than the average speed, that would solve the distant starlight problem, wouldn't it? Because I don't have to send light out to the galaxies and reflect it back. It only has to make a one-way trip. It only has to go from there to here. But, so, so I'm hoping that this will be the case, but hoping for something doesn't make it so. We want to see if we can do an experiment to measure the one-way speed of light. So how are you going to do that? How are you going to measure the speed of light just on a one-way trip and not a round trip? Well, you can't use a mirror anymore. Instead, you've got to use two clocks. You've got to use one clock to tell you when to start the light pulse, and then another one to uh, record when it impacts. Yes? So I'm going to stand over here. When this clock strikes noon, I send out the pulse, and my buddy's over there with his clock. And when he sees the pulse, he looks at his clock, and you're thinking that'll say, you know, one second past noon. Yes? Well, I tried this in my office. I don't have a long hallway, but I have the distance between my watch and the clock on my phone. And I, have, I turned on the light right when it hit noon, and the light beam went over to the phone. As soon as the phone, you know, lit up, uh, I said, oh, 12.05, takes five minutes for light to get from my watch to the phone, right? No, you're not buying that? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? I, when, when my clock hits noon, I turn on the light, it goes over, hits the phone, the phone says 12.05, five minutes. I made an assumption, didn't I? A faulty assumption. And that is, I assumed that the clocks were synchronized. Uh, obviously, the clock on my phone is five minutes fast. I do that so I don't miss staff meetings. Okay, so only, only if the clocks are synchronized could you measure the speed of light this way. And by the way, they have to be exactly synchronized because the speed of light is very quick, whatever it is. We know it's quick. So uh, if, it, if, if that other clock is just a little bit off, you'll get the wrong answer for the speed of light. It could be very wrong. You say, no problem. We'll make sure the clocks are synchronized. That turns out to be very difficult to do with clocks that are separated by distance. Normally, the way we synchronize clocks is with a radio transmission. In fact, my watch um, does that. It receives a signal from the radio transmitter in Fort Collins, which is tied into the atomic clock in Boulder. And every night it receives that signal. I never have to set it. It's pretty neat. But it's not maybe exactly synchronized, right? Because that radio pulse actually takes a little bit of time to travel 
from the source clock to the receiver clock. Radio is fast, but it's not instantaneous. So well, maybe what we could do, of course, if we knew the amount of time it took the radio pulse to travel from here to here, we could subtract that off. We could push that clock forward a little bit. Well, how fast does radio travel? You know the answer to that? It travels at the speed of light. Yeah. And so th that's the very thing I'm trying to measure. That's the very thing I don't know is the one-way speed of light. Radio, we know radio travels at the speed of light because if I, if I have a radio transmitter and a flashlight, they'll hit the wall at the same time. We know that. We just don't know what that speed is. My point is you'd have to already know the one-way speed of light in order to synchronize clocks by radio transmission. Now, I don't worry that my clock is maybe slightly behind the one in, in Boulder uh, because I, I'm not trying to measure the speed of light. But if you're trying to measure the speed of light, they have to be exactly synchronized. Some people, for some reason, have thought if you put the radio transmitter in the middle, that'll solve it, right? Because then you send the radio pulse in both directions and, and both clocks are synchronized to noon at the same time. It, it, it doesn't matter what the speed of light is, but in fact it does because that presumes that the speed of light and therefore the speed of radio is the same in both directions. If it's different, then this clock gets set to noon first and that clock gets set to noon second. See, noon there and then noon there. And they're not synchronized. See, so you can't synchronize clocks that way. It doesn't work. One last resort. We'll synchronize two clocks in the same place. That's easy to do because you can see they're both reading the same time at the same time. Then we'll move one of them or both of them to opposite ends of the hallway. Yes? That should work, right? It doesn't because according to Einstein, motion affects the passage of time. The very, fa the very act of moving the clock has caused it to become desynchronized from its, uh, from its buddy. Now, it turns out there's an equation that can tell you how much the clock has become desynchronized and you could compensate for it. And in that equation is the speed of light. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? It's almost as if God doesn't want us to know the one-way speed of light. Here's, here's, the, here's what the implication of this is. Apparently, it's impossible to synchronize clocks without knowing the one-way speed of light in advance. And it's impossible to measure the one-way speed of light without synchronized clocks. So you see, we're stuck in a permanent catch-22. It is fundamentally impossible to measure the one-way speed of light. It cannot be done because you need to have synchronized clocks. And the only way you can have synchronized clocks is if you already knew the one-way speed of light. It cannot be done. Now, when you have a catch-22 like this, it suggests that the question may be a bad question, a faulty question. And so I'm going to conclude that the one-way speed of light is not actually a property of nature at all, but is something that is a convention. A convention is something that we choose and we all agree to it and we stick with it and it works. Like driving on the right side of the road. That's a convention. We all agree to that and it works. But in other nations, they pick the left side of the road. And as long as they all agree to it, it works too. You see, that's a convention. It's not, it's, you know, if, if we asked them, um, well, what, you know, in the universe, what is the correct side of the road to drive on? That question is meaningless because it depends on what country you're in. It depends on where you're at. Or how many, um, if I had a table that's, let's say it's one yard long or maybe it's three feet long, which is it? Is it one or three? What's the right answer? Is it one yard or is it three feet? What's, well, what's the answer, right? It's, well, yeah, it's both, isn't it? Well, is the number, should the number be one or should it be three? Well, you tell me what you want to, you will tell me if you're using yards or feet and I'll tell you what the answer is. The one-way speed of light is like that. We get to choose what it is and that tells us how to synchronize our clocks. And then, whatever, then when you measure the one-way speed of light with your synchronized clocks, you'll find it was whatever you chose. Yeah. Okay? So the lightning bolt strikes exactly in between these two clocks. And we're going to decide that the speed of light's the same in both directions. We can do that. We're going to choose that. And then uh, the two clocks are synchronized. But if you want to make a different choice, you can do that too. And you can synchronize them differently that light requires the same time to traverse the path A to M as for the path B to M is in reality neither a supposition nor a hypothesis about the physical nature of light, but a stipulation which I can make of my own free will in order to arrive at a definition of simultaneity. We choose the one-way speed of light, and that tells us how to synchronize clocks. And that quote is by Albert Einstein. Einstein recognized that the one-way speed of light is not something you measure, it's something you choose. Which means I can choose it to be something very different than what most people do. In fact, I can choose the speed of light to be infinite when it's direct, directly toward me 
and half C when it's moving away. And the reason I picked those two values, it, it has to average to C. It has to average to the speed of light that's the round trip speed. Okay, but you get to pick the one-way speed, and then the average will tell you what the return trip has to be. And it turns out it's one half C if you make it infinite in one direction, because it's a time averaged. And one of the reasons I choose this is because it solves the distant starlight problem. But another reason is because all ancient cultures implicitly used this definition. They didn't subtract off light travel time because they didn't know what the speed of light was. When you saw something, that's when it happened. And so I'm going to suggest that the distant starlight is solved if we use this. I'm going to call it an anisotropic, which means different, different directions, anisotropic synchrony convention, or ASK. Using the anisotropic synchrony convention, light takes no time at all to get from distant galaxies to here. And according to Einstein, I'm free to, I'm free to synchronize clocks that way. And the distant starlight problem, therefore, is solved if the Bible's using that convention too. And so that's really the only issue. Is the Bible using this alternate, this uh, anisotropic synchrony convention, or is it using Einstein convention, or is it using something else? It's using some convention, because it's talking about time. So there's some convention there. I think it, the Bible is using this anisotropic synchrony convention. I'm going to show you why. Well, I already mentioned one reason. All ancient cultures used that. And the Bible is meant to be understood by everybody, not just by modern physicists. But if you take a look at Genesis 1, 14 and 15, then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and, and years. And later we find this is the sun, the moon, and the stars also, the greater light, the lesser light, the, star, the stars also. He says, and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. It's that last little phrase, and it was so. What was so? Well, they, they gave light on the earth. You see, God created them to give light on the earth, and apparently they immediately did, and it was so. That suggests to me that the Bible is using this anisotropic synchrony convention whereby light reaches the observer in no time at all. And according to Einstein, that is a legitimate convention. And, and by the way, I'm not suggesting that the alternative, that the speed of light is the same in all directions, is wrong. Because that's like saying a table, it's wrong to say it's one yard long. It's actually three feet. They're just two different ways of measuring things. And so I'm going to suggest that the, the convention the Bible uses allows light to get here instantaneously. It's not a problem. Uh, there could be other answers to that, but this is one that works, and nobody's been able to refute it, so I think it's a pretty good model. Well, we've seen that the... Uh, Glory of the Lord is revealed in the heavens. We've seen that the Bible is right when it speaks on the basics of astronomy. We've seen that the Bible is right when it talks about the age of the universe, and there's evidence that lines up with that. We've seen that the earth is unique, as the Bible indicates, and we've seen that starlight is not a problem for thousands of years. In fact, it can get here instantaneously if you're using the anisotropic synchrony convention, and there are other ways to do it as well.